Good, how are you? Good. All right. So I want to talk to you about your article, canceling Zizek, or sorry, don't cancel Zizek on your Substack philosophy for the people, which highly recommend to anyone who wants just a basic overview of philosophy and maybe only took like one undergrad class in philosophy and like found it a little bit insufferable. This is different. So I recommend it. <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, this article that you wrote was a response to another article in Counterpunch by Gabriel Rockhill called Capitalism's Court Jester, Slavoj Zizek. And I found this article pretty off-putting, like a little bit comical to an extent with the way it started by basically saying, oh, Foreign Policy Magazine listed Slavoj Zizek as one of its top 100 global thinkers in 2012, but it did the same thing with Dick Cheney and Netanyahu and Erdogan. Are these people the same? Probably. And <laughs> I view that as basically saying like, well, Noam Chomsky is a war criminal like Henry Kissinger because they held a lecture at the same like lecture hall at MIT, right? But that's how the article started off. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, I'd, I'd actually be fascinated to uh, to know, um, like I'm really curious now, like I didn't even think about this when I was reading the Rock Hill, but, uh, you know, it's like there are a hundred people on that list, you know, <laughs> like uh, I want to know, like, okay, so I'm just, I'm just scrolling through it now. It's like Martha Nussbaum, is on that list who, you know, if, if people, you know, if people aren't familiar with her, she's a philosopher. She's, uh, you know, I don't know. I think she's like pretty left wing. I don't, you know, like, like, it's like, is, is Martha Nussbaum like Dick Cheney now? Like, 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 who, like there, there are a hundred names on the list. I mean, presumably it's just like somebody's idea of like, oh, these are like a bunch of significant people. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't think there's going to be a coherent ideological agenda for the entire list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. I'm like, you know, Slavoj Zizek. I remember watching this Vice interview with him probably five years ago. And to be honest, the way the interviewer started off, this made me realize like, oh, this is why Zizek would be on this type of list because he's like, well, Zizek is a communist philosopher uh, who actually happens to have a sense of humor. So obviously, like, that will have appeal. <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. I mean, like, you know, I, I think he's somebody who probably mm. is at that sweet spot of uh, having, um, you know, he's got the, uh, that, like, somebody who has a purely academic following for, for that work, but, like, lots of people are interested in what he has to say for political reasons, and, like, also, he's just like obviously a super entertaining character. I mean, I remember watching the uh, uh, Pervert's Guide to Ideology uh, when that movie came out in, in 2012, you know, and it's like, yeah, it's, I mean, that's just fun. I mean, it's like, you know, like doing the the scene from They Live with the, uh, the you know, the, the line about eating out of the trash can. And I'm not going to. Right. Accent, but, you, know, you know, I eat out of the trash can of ideology, you know, every day. It's like, yeah, sure. it's like, you know, whatever else is true. Like that's, that's something people are going to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, definitely. And like I, in I recommend people who might not be too familiar with them to look up a uh, Slavoj Zizek Mongol rape, dusty testicle joke. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, very few people could execute that joke the way he did. So that's something about, you know, comedic timing there as well. But um, another thing though in the piece that I found also disconcerting is that th there was a lot of hand-wringing over Zizek equating Stalin to Hitler, but even going so far as to saying that, well, living in Yugoslavia under like authoritarian communism, that was actually probably the, the worst system ever, right? And I, well, I find... He uh, doesn't even exactly say that, I think. Like, he has a... Uh, I mean, like, what I, you know, what I can remember of the uh, of the of that part of the Rock Hill piece, uh, you know, he does quote a bunch of comments about both Stalin and Hitler, but I actually don't think in any of them that he actually does say Mm -hmm. that Stalin is worse than Hitler right I mean like he has a 
he like he just Rock Hill just kind of collates a bunch of of quotes that you know that he disapproves of that he can kind of tut tut about about these subjects and sort of puts them together that way. But um, I mean, part of why I was so frustrated with this article, and I should say, like the essay that I wrote is just a response to Rock Hill. It certainly mm. does respond to some of what he says, but it does try to sort of cast a slightly wider net in terms of both mm. thinking about what I found valuable about engaging with Zizek's work over the years and also, um, and also, yeah, addressing Rock Hill, but also a few other sort of big sweeping critiques that people have made. But like, I kind of knew that this was going to be one of those when I first started writing it, mm -hmm. uh, when I first started reading rather than the Rock Hill, uh, because in those opening paragraphs, I, I think this is what you're thinking of with the, the Hitler stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he does something that was very familiar to me from, uh, from other examples of articles like this I've read over the years, like the Thomas Mueller Nielsen thing from Current Affairs would be another example of that, uh, where he he just kind of quotes these like little shocking sounded snippets uh, from, mm -hmm. uh, from the, from things that Zizek has written and the way that he quotes them. Like, so like, I, I think, um, you know, maybe this is worse, right. Than, than the way, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the way you quoted it, but it's like, I think what he actually says is that, uh, uh, so I think one of the quotes he does, which is like a classic sort of thing that people dig up to be like, Oh my God, look at this like horrendous clown is uh, Zizek saying that Gandhi was more violent than Hitler. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's kind of funny because, and then he quotes, so he quotes that and then he, uh, and he, and he says like, um, you know, actually I think the sort of like most shocking one is like Hitler wasn't violent enough. And then like the way Rock Hill quotes it, you know, he says, oh, so, maybe Zizek saying that Hitler shouldn't have taken a page from Stalin, you know, and then he quotes some stuff about like Zizek saying that like Stalin was bad, which, you know, I'm sorry is, you know, I mean, he was, right? we, we, like, we should agree uh, to that. Yeah. <laughs> well, this should not be a hot take, right? Like whatever you think about the rest of it, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, but uh, he's either being a little dishonest or else he just didn't read very carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if some of how you end up with producing things like this is you just kind of skim things until you sort of see something that seems really objectionable to you and you kind of write it down. Mm. And, you know, it's like a very uh, prosecutorial kind of way of doing things that like you're not really trying to like grapple with the text or figure out, okay, what does he mean by that? Why is he saying that? What's his argument, right? You know, you're not doing any of that. You're just kind of being like, uh, ooh, I got him, right? Yeah, you know? yeah. You know, I can't believe you said this, right? This is going to the file. Mm -hmm. But um, but anybody who's actually read any of that stuff that he's talking about, like, will immediately recognize that, um, like, yeah, Zizek does this thing sometimes. And you can object to this if you want to. It's like a writing style or a way of presenting arguments. But where he'll say, he'll use a sort of uh, shockingly counterintuitive like formulation you know it's like actually i'm gonna argue that you know and that it's that it, it just sounds crazy mm -hmm. and then like usually within a couple paragraphs at most but usually like a couple sentences mm -hmm. he's said and here is exactly what i mean by that right yeah. and, he, and he makes his case and you know i could see it in the hands of another writer or just like you know, if it, it was just wasn't executed well or whatever, I could see this being annoyed. It's like, oh, you're going to say something that's like, you know, like attention grabbingly shocking and that it's just going to be like, you're just going to retreat into this like mod or whatever. But I don't think that's really what he's doing, right? I think that like my experience of this, at least your mileage may vary, is that when I read this stuff, when I get to the explanation, I don't feel like, oh, well, that's all. Then why did you say the, you know, the shocking thing, right? Like, I feel like, no, you're actually still, like, there's actually still, even though it sort of makes more sense than it sounded like at first, there's there's still something really interesting going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in, like, the, the Hitler case, it's like, okay, you know, he's not saying, like, he's not saying Hitler should have killed more people, right? You know, or 
God, they maybe did kill a bunch of people that we don't know about, right? Like, uh, like that's not the claim, right? The claim is that, I mean, this is this whole thing about objective and subjective violence that, uh, you know, like the way he's using the word violence is like forcefully imposing your will on the world around you and, and, and kind of force everybody to, you know, to see to that. And, you know, things looks and sometimes that's a good thing to do. You should do that because like the mm. world is the world is configured in horrible ways and you should force it into something better. And like and ultimately the sense in which you say the Gandhi is more uh vile than Hitler is, you know, Hitler in his incredibly murderous way was ultimately interested in defending the capitalist status quo. Uh whereas Gandhi was actually making much, you know, in terms of forcefully you know like yeah forcing his will into the world is uh is actually making like much more dramatic changes that you know that he's like throwing off this like deeply entrenched regime of you know british colonialism and all of that's just to say like uh i don't know man i think that like you could object to you should say oh we should use the word violence this way that he's using it fine right we could have that conversation i actually mm-hmm. think article by Oren D.B. called uh, Defining Violence, where he makes an argument that, um, oh, this is actually like, you know, we should be using the the word in a much narrower way, right? That Like he quotes Jack in the beginning and, you know, but he he makes an argument that we should be using the word in a much narrower way than that. And, you know, I think he has like enough of a point or at least like enough of a case that I've, I've assigned that article in in classes and you know along with the zizek and it's like i think there's an interesting discussion to be had there but like whatever you think about that um it's 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 just like it's just a little absurd to to just quote this stuff in this sort of spirit of like oh oh look look at look at uh you know look at how ridiculous or offensive he is you know he said this thing and it's like what what are you doing like you like, it, why would you even bring that up if you're not going to, like, do the, like, here is the thing that on that same page you said he met by it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And another thing that I found pretty interesting is, and maybe even a little bit contradictory, is that there's one section of your article where you mention how Zizek does believe in a sort of bureaucratic socialism, which I personally am a big fan of like basically the idea that, yeah, maybe I don't want to be in every single meeting that concerns like the maintenance of water pipes. Now I probably would, but I'm, I'm a sick person. Right. But the average person (laughs) wouldn't want to do that. And that's like a part of what is supposed to make socialism, uh, you know, more liberating. But I wonder if like, there's a contradiction between that sentiment and the other sentiment where he also talks about in his book in defense of lost causes where he's like, well, there was a radical impulse behind Stalinism, but we need to like channel that towards liberatory like means. Right. And I wonder if like you find those two a little bit contradictory. Uh, yeah. So I I guess I do think that those those ultimately are consistent with each other. Uh, But but it is interesting you mentioned uh, the argument in defense of lost causes, uh, because this is, you know, kind of funny, like you brought up earlier that Rock Hill is is bringing up uh, uh, Zizek's um, early kind of activities is like a dissident in communist Yugoslavia mm. in the 1980s and it's like a uh his like very brief time as uh uh as as like a Slovenian politician in newly independent Slovenia at the beginning of ni- 1990s which is very funny to think about by the way it's like okay so there's Slovenians running around who are like you know is there like a birdie would have one thing there like you know like a, it's like hey don't blame me I voted for Slavoj right you know <laughs> Yeah, uh, but uh, but it is a little bit funny because Rock Hill's line of attack there is kind of the opposite of what used to be standard for these critiques of Zizek, even ones that emerge from within the socialist left, like that you know Thomas Wilson Mueller Nielsen piece that I mentioned earlier. Um, the, the what is Zizek for? Uh, that 
it used to be that like the line of attack was always that like oh this guy's like a you know closet stalinist mm-hmm. right or maybe not so closeted that like you know it's like he's he's like too soft on or nostalgic for you know the yeah. the communist past and it's and, and indifferent to its authoritarian horrors and so like thomas uh, muller neil said uh that article quotes in that same sort of like here's a little snippet that i'm going to quote because it's so shocking way mm-hmm. uh Zizek saying that uh, that uh, you know he would prefer you know Stalinism to to sort of uh, to liberalism ultimately, and to, you know, it's like oh my god really right you know like uh, but again you actually read that book that you just mentioned and you see well you know he's very clear on what he means by that and you you just summarized it very well right so I won't repeat it but like. Um, you know, point is that like we should just you know try again we should just like recreate east germany and hope it goes better this time right it's, mm-hmm. it's that there is this underlying radical impulse you know as, as as flawed as it was right it's it's still there's some still some kind of attempt to at create a radically different world mm-hmm. uh and and you should you know and, and and we should should give we should give up on that impulse right that's the that's the in defense of lost causes argument and so is that intention with the point in a plea for bureaucratic socialism? Maybe, but I, I don't think like uh, unsolvable tension, right? In other words, like I think that you know, the point is making a, um, a plea for bureaucratic socialism as, again, you, you know, what you just said, and I, uh, I will just say I, I would skip that meeting, uh, like to put it mildly, right? Like, <laughs> Uh, but and there is a sort of more general thing here that like I I actually do credit in the essay that you know engaging with his work over the years has made me think a little bit harder about which is like okay what kind of what kind of social society would I actually want like like how would I actually want that to to work and I don't think um like if you say well i want like radically participatory democracy and everything all the time you know that sort of i guess i kind of agree with him i think that sort of sounds good until you start to actually think about what that would be like Mm -hmm. um that you know i sort of i i kind of really don't trust people who don't hate meetings uh but uh you know that's me but like you know even peeling back from that right like i i think um it's you know you're losing um you just can't have a fun you know like functional organizations without some degree of operational hierarchy in in practice right so uh, so I guess your question was, is that um, maybe, the, you know, tell me if this, this gets at what you're asking, but like, is this, is that uh, sort of defeatist ultimately? Like, oh, uh, we shouldn't try to do the really radical thing, which would be, you know, total participatory democracy uh, because, you know, we wouldn't like it, you know, whatever. Mm. Uh, it's or it's it's just it's just gonna be too, too dysfunctional or whatever like that is, is that sort of defeatist in a way that conflicts with saying we should hold on to this like radical impulse to try to create this this uh this different kind of society yeah and i guess for me it's also the fact that, like i kind of view bureaucratic socialism as something that is more ideal for me but also as something that would mainly be achieved by democratizing parts of even like liberal capitalism rather than throwing out the baby with the bathwater and maybe getting something much worse (laughs) yeah okay uh yeah i mean so there are maybe two questions here one is about like radical ass like basically sort of the ballot well maybe they're the same question because maybe maybe they're both different ways of asking about like the sort of balance between having radical long-term political horizons and having sort of some sense of pragmatism about ways that that could go wrong and and ways that you want to avoid that right so um like i mean to me saying we should you know 
I mean, look, I think we should, I think the amount of democratic accountability that uh, exists within the economic hierarchy of capitalism, which is basically none, is too little. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, but like I also do take on board, you know, Zizek's point, you know, that the, uh, that actually we're losing some of the benefits of socialism if, if we have to sort of, uh, you know, like if, if it is like nonstop, uh, you know, nonstop participatory democracy that like there, maybe there is some kind of balance to strike there that you want to, uh, like, you know, yeah, you want your relationship to, you know, the water, gas, and electric to be never having to think about them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you want to be like, if, if part of the point, you know, is you want to be freed up to pursue uh, your own projects to, you know, spend your time the way you want to spend it, you know, the, the more that like, just kind of administering things as an all consuming task, you know, the more that, that gets lost. Uh, I think that that's actually quite consistent with saying we should hold on to the sort of underlying radical impulse. It's just sort of like tried to think harder about like, okay, look, you don't want to recreate East Germany. That would be really bad. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also don't want to do like, I don't even know, like you, you also don't want to do like, you know, Zuccotti park forever on a loop, you know, it all right. society. Uh, and so if you want to try again and try better, Right. I mean, that's the uh, that that quote at the beginning of the book, right? The try again, fail again, you know, fail better. Uh, if you want to. If you want to try again in a, in a smarter way, right, I mean, you should take on board both points. Uh, and then as far as like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Um, I mean, I guess. If it's not to try it, I think it's just like I think I think where the action is, like the interesting debate is going to be about what's baby and what's bathwater. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, of course, a lot of times that can definitely be, be, be muddied. Right. Um, and I guess, you know, another thing that I find pretty interesting about Zizek, and I actually find this to be um, incredibly important, I, I, him to be an incredibly important voice in this regard um, is how he has seemed to be, and I, wrote, I know he wrote an op-ed about this in The Guardian not too long ago. He has seemed to be unabashedly supportive of Western countries providing military assistance to Ukraine, uh, something that a lot of leftists, unfortunately, in my opinion, are not a big fan of. And yeah. I, I do wonder if some of that also comes from his experience of grow I, I mean living in slovenia now right but even you know growing up in in the former yugoslavia of like hey you know there is an imperialist power that is knocking on the doorstep right and you kind of have to address that imperialist power and i feel like a lot of times you know leftists especially in the u.s uh yeah. are are not aware of the i guess the material implications of that reality the way he is sure yeah I mean, I think, uh, I mean, this is an interesting one because I think you and he are probably in, in much uh, closer alignment on that than the two of you are with me about this. But I think, uh, uh, I mean, he was on the, the show like a week or so ago. I don't, I don't remember time blurs together, but the, uh, uh, he, and, you know, and, and you know, we did find stuff to agree on about this, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I am, I am definitely, uh, you know, much, much more of a dove about that. I definitely worry more about the possibility for, for like, you know, great power conflict and, uh, and what that could turn into, uh, than, than he seems to, um, you know, that, um, you know, if so, you know, but I, I do take your point, right? That I think that, of course, right? Like, a, you know, if you're sort of trying to balance some of these priorities, right? That you uh, look, it, it's very, very bad that Russia invaded Ukraine and, uh, uh, and, 
uh, you know, and, and you know, the, the, you know, certainly, you know, once it's happened or whatever, I, I mean, we could argue about like what the, uh, you know, sort of realistic possibility is to, to sort of de-escalate and, and, you know, and, and have, have some kind of, uh, you know, ceasefire negotiations, but like until that happens, right? I mean, you know, Ukrainians certainly have a right to, you know, try to preserve themselves from it. And it's, um, and, you know, and, and I think it's understandable that, you know, people elsewhere in the region get very nervous about it. Uh, and, but also, you know, again, I, I do think that uh, sort of spiral of escalation between the United States and Russia could be really, really, really bad. And, uh, and, and I do also, you know, and, and I do think that uh, there, you know, and I, and I do, it does disturb me that there hasn't been, you know, an, an attempt to sort of walk, you know, walk back from that, you know, we can argue about whether what that would look like and whether it'd be worth it. But like, but look, if you're trying to balance all that, yeah, I mean, I not that this is the same thing because I don't think it is, right? But it's like part of, um, like part of the reason that you know Christopher Hitchens ended up supporting the war in Iraq is that he was uh, spending time in the nineties in Iraqi Kurdistan, and you know if you if you lived in the Kurdish enclave in northern Iraq, you know you're, uh, you know very top of your priority list was 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 sort of getting rid of this like looming menace of Saddam Hussein and you know that's that's totally understandable to me right I mean I, that is that's not a mystery to me why they felt that way like I don't think it makes them imperialist lackeys or whatever like I, I think that's uh I think that's totally understandable from their perspective but I think that you know that doesn't necessarily mean that at the end of the day I think that's the right thing to do. You know, I think that the, uh, I mean, I obviously think we shouldn't have invaded Iraq. Um, now, I don't think that this is as clear cut of case as that, right? Because because the United States isn't, you know, doing anything that's that's like that, right? I mean, you know, Russia invaded, like that was the real equivalent there. Uh, but, you know, but I do think, um, you know, you could question whether, sort of uh you know unconditional aid uh you know sort of uh and and sort of taking these things that kind of had been lines before but you know the the line keeps on getting shifted you know about like what kinds of weapons are going to be spent you know training people in the u.s the uh you know like in direct intelligence you know uh involvement and you know in like operations to assassinate russian generals things like that i mean like i I think, uh, you know, and, and even just sort of, uh, you know, like, I, I think there's a general concern about empower, you know, like, like giving the American warfare state like a new lease on life, right? I mean, a sort of new, a new ideological cause, you know, to, uh, to get, uh, you know, now that the war on terror, you know, like kind of doesn't have any juice anymore, you know, I think, I think about getting people to sort of think of this, uh, uh, you know, to uh like sort of see this you know this new cold wars with russia or china as the kind of you know as the kind of center of attention for uh america's military posture in the world and you know and uh you know so i have a i know all that was was kind of all over the place forgive me i i i am uh i'm like a little bit scattered right now but like I hope that in all of that, right, I mean, I've, I've, I've kind of gestured at, like, why maybe I have a little bit of a different perspective on this, but, like, also, yeah, I mean, just to not bury the lead here, like, yeah, I mean, I agree with you, I mean, like, he has, uh, you know, he, he grew up in a, you know, in a country that, uh, you know, was, um, you know, like, I guess by the time he came along, right, you know, was, was like, nobody was like really worried that the Soviet Union was going to invade Yugoslavia or whatever. But I mean, like that, that had been, you know, a concern mm -hmm. like back in the forties, certainly. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, I, I, and I think just, you know, being in the same general region of the world, I mean, like, I, I think it's, it's always easier, you know, for, uh, I think every, you know, every 5,000 miles that you get closer to the Ukrainian border, you know, the, uh, the, the sort of, easier I find it to understand, you know, why, like, you know, kind of, uh, 
you know, stopping that would, you know, would, would seem like the most, you know, the most pressing priority to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's definitely true. And the way I also kind of view it, to be honest, is that since most of the aid in general seems to be weapons already in the Pentagon's inventory, my logic is also, well, I'd rather those weapons be sent to Ukrainian soldiers than to police departments in the United States, <laughs> which also happens. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's, I, I am. Uh, I, yeah, that's true. Uh, they are, uh, they are manufacturing new ones uh, at a, uh, at a pretty furious clip, but the, uh, but if I, I, you know, I, I guess if it, uh, I guess if it delays uh, the, uh, you know, city of Grand Rapids getting a, get a, tra- a tank in an aircraft credit carrier that is, you know, that is a bright side. Yeah, exactly. Uh, anti-imperialist and anti-police brutality in one. <laughs> no. But uh, just, just, are you fine with the, just one final question? Sure, go for yeah. it. Yep. So another thing about Zizek that uh, is quite controversial, but I think, I think the underlying argument here is correct. So like, for example, he made some, arguments i think back in 2016 uh, maybe even 2014 as well talking about how well europe may have a problem with an influx of refugees coming from countries that do not share what he stated as western liberal values right now my thing with that statement is if you're talking about assimilation into a society right Not even just from the perspective of like the society that's taking in the immigrants, but also from the immigrants themselves. I do think like that is an important question to bring up. But I also wonder, like, is there a risk there towards giving some ammo to Sam Harris or Bill Maher type Islamophobia? (laughs) Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I think that like I will I will say that. Uh, that his own positions on, you know, Islam, uh, as far as I, I could, you know, I've ever been able to tell, uh, are much more sympathetic uh, than those guys that you you just mentioned, right? I mean, like certainly the conversations I've seen where the the subject comes up, I mean, like I think he's actually, uh, you know, I mean, for better or for worse, right? Whether you see it as a good thing or a bad thing, I think he's actually like pretty. You know, I mean, he's obviously a non-believer, but he's like sort of very uh, intrigued by and kind of soft on religion in general. You know, but um, but yeah, I, I think that you know, so yeah, you're talking about the the double blackmail, right? That's the that's the book where he talks about this, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, I think he probably does you know say things that disagree with it there, but I also think that it's worth sort of taking a long step back. And thinking about the context that um like what's the what's the point of this book right like what's the point of like the articles that he wrote about this stuff uh you know what is he arguing for right that like uh and ultimately his his position you know i mean even if he's being you know sort of uh like you know like dialectically kind of try to take in like you know like like whatever's you know the sort of best points made against you or whatever but it's like ultimately his position is they, they should have taken in you know refugees right should, should take in more refugees as far as I, I think right i think that's his view uh and so it's it's like look let's be uh you know like let's be real about the the uh that this is not like a this is not a simple issue, right? You know that there are uh, there like that there are real uh, like there are real questions about how some of this plays out, and you know, in some of these these countries. Uh, but ultimately, he is arguing for the the pro refugee position. Now, that doesn't mean that like what he says in the book is above criticism, or that you know you can't you know, or, or that like okay, just because he's like ultimately on the right side or whatever, that you can't say he's like he's saying things that are wrong um you know like it's it's fine to say he's like 
conceding much more than he needs to to the other side and making that argument or the kind of concern that you just raised you know that he's uh uh that uh that he's uh you know that like he's he's sort of in the you know in kind of granting some of these points on his way to to argue for the contrary position he might still be giving ammunition to you know to the 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 mars and harrises of the the world you know i think those are you know probably fair concerns to have and we kind of have to look at it case by case you know exactly what he said about some of this stuff but i i mean i guess what it reminds me of just a little bit is like when people would um there's this thing that people will do every once in a while i mean i think probably like on a pretty regular pace basis for like the last like hundred years where uh where some uh anti socialist writer will will dig up the sort of most like objectionable passages in Karl Marx's uh, pamphlet on the Jewish question, mm -hmm. which you know, doesn't help that the, the name sounds like a Nazi tract, right? You know, it's like, I'm a Jewish question. What's that, right? You know, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and they'll sort of bring it up in this like, aha, see, right? You know, anti-Semitism. And, you know, it's not totally wrong in that case. Like, I think that in the last section of On the Jewish Question, Marx like uses some analogies and some wordplay that do traffic in, in some of the, the anti-Semitic ideas that were, you know, um, like like the fucking water, like in Europe at the at the time that he's writing. I mean, just just everywhere, right? You know, and, and like, you know, and he has like uh, you know, despite being ethnically Jewish, I mean he has taken, you know, parts of that on 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 board and some of the analogies and some of the wordplay reflects that. But also like, guys, what's the point of that book? The, that pamphlet, right? On the Jewish question, that essay. Like he's uh like the like he's he's on the pro emancipation, you know, Jewish emancipation or pro equal civil liberal, you know, legal rights for Jewish people question. In fact he's writing it in response to his friend you know, not his friend, but his fellow Yanka Gailey, Bruno Bauer, um, you know, taking the opposite position and saying, no, no, no actually, uh, you know, if we're going to, everybody should have to give up their religious peculiarities if we're going to be part of a secular state together after we, you know, after the revolution or whatever. And, uh, and so actually we shouldn't support, you know, equal civil and legal rights for, for Jewish people. What is this demand for that? And, and Marx is, is disagreeing with it. And it's like, I, I don't know. I, I just, I think a lot of this stuff, like, like in the Zizek case, um, not that I think anything that Zizek says, double back bail is is good, is uh, is as bad, right? As the as as like the the bad, you know, the bad stuff, you know, the Jewish question. But like the sort of basic thing that I get impatient with about both of them is is like a little bit the same, you know, because it's like, okay, like what are you doing here? Are you trying to address the case that somebody's making like as as like you know saying okay do i what do i think about the overall argument they're building you know do i agree with their conclusion is good argument is you know is is this is this a helpful thing for you know human progress that they're, they're making this argument or not um and along the road to that sure whatever i mean nitpick to your heart's content i'd right? say like no, no no this part is wrong right he got this thing wrong this is a bad call this is a uh uh you should you know he's conceding way too much to the other side of this part whatever that's fine but like i i just get frustrated when when i see some of these critiques that don't really seem to be like trying to comprehensive like that like again it, it just kind of feels like you know i'm gonna like flip through this until i can find the bad stuff and then i'll like write you know i'll write down the bad stuff so i can file my report about it later yeah, right. Well, that being said, you know, I say this to provoke you, but uh, <laughs> if y'all are watching, uh, read uh, Ben Burgess's Philosopher of the People Substack and, you know, catch him on, give them an argument on YouTube. And uh, again, Ben, thanks for, uh, you know, giving me the time. All right. Thank you so much, Adrian. Right, have a great day. Thanks.